Take your Bibles tonight, if you would, to the 73rd Psalm. The 73rd Psalm. The pastor asked that I give a little bit of update or testimony. Let me kind of do it this way, if you would. When I was in Bible college, I was already older. I'd already been through the military, and, and I watched a lot of young men come to Bible college and while they were at Bible college, when it got time to leave, they graduated and they just kind of like liked it there. And they were staying and Sherry and I saw that and I felt like, you know, uh, I must do the works of him that sent me while it is day for the night cometh and no man can work. And I asked the Lord, I really did, I prayed, I said, Lord, don't let me stay one day past graduating. I want to be in the work somewhere. And, uh, and, of course, that was a year before I ever graduated high, or graduated college. And the amazing thing was, within three weeks, God had opened the door, and I was still in college. And he opened the door, and I started pastoring a year before I got out of college. And that was an adventure. <laughs> and I took a church that had five people. And a county had 3,500. That's where God put me. And I fell in love with those people, and so I started pastoring there. And then, you know, I've always had a place to pastor. I've always been busy. Then came the time when God spoke to me about it. It was time to translate the church to the next generation. I had preached to you all, especially in having youth leaders in. Listen, we're training them to bring the next generation in. And if you don't train them, there'll be no next generation. And so I knew I was translating out. And, and while I'm very happy to be done with the pressures of pastoring, I am not ready to sit down and do nothing. So I started praying last year, Lord. And I had a conversation with Brother Richard. Of the, last year, I said, once you're ordained and once we've decided you're the pastor then I'm going to start getting away you you know I've been here 22 years I don't go anywhere this is where I'm supposed to be and so I started praying Lord would you open up doors and it was amazing that God opened those doors and I started going out I've now been in 10 churches in the last seven months that are not here and I want to say one thing. This is home. I am always so glad when I come home. But what I've found, and I've been trying to network with different pastors and churches that have needs and stuff, and far beyond what I've seen, churches are hurting. And COVID's only made it worse. Um, just talked to a church this morning on my way to Akron. Uh, of course, I've been pastoring over there or preaching over there. I guess not pastoring over there, but preaching over there. And uh, I was on the phone with a church this morning. It's just begging someone to come and stand in the pulpit for them. And the problem is they're so far away, there's no way I could do it because I'd have to finance it. And they're hurting. And it is un it's not un unnormal. Churches are really, really hurting. So I feel like God has kind of given me the ministry as I translate out of the pastorate into just trying to help some churches. And it's funny, I'm not interested in the big city churches. Let the big city preachers take care of them. You know what I'm interested in? Those churches where people don't want to go to. But they need it. They need it. And so pray for Sherry and I. We're, obviously, this is our home. It's going to remain our home. It's going to stay our home. But pray that uh, while I'm helping the church at Akron, and when that's taken care of and their pastor is there, uh, I'm not interested in pastoring. I'm not. Uh, when their pastor is there, then God will open another door. And just ask him not to open too many doors at one time, if you would. Because that's been happening. Uh, I, I literally uh, have had churches call and ask me to come as far as four and 500 miles away. A little bit hard to do that. 
And so please be praying. By the way, our area of the country, the first year I was here, Miss Glinda can tell you this, the first year I was here, we went up in Nebraska to find Jason a church. And we're going, where are all the churches? Someone needs to do something. Where are all the churches? I'm not talking about trying to reach the un, the, the un church. I'm talking about supplying those who want to be in church already. Where are all the churches? Where are all the churches? So be praying uh, for us, if you would, like we prayed for Ogallala when we found out that they needed some help and Ken started going and helping them. And, uh, you know, let's just pray for churches. And, and, and by the way, build what you have and thank God for what you have. And all God's people said, Psalm 73 tonight, if you would. If you look at the title of Psalm 73, and I've said this before, and everybody here probably knows that Psalm 73 is one of my favorite psalms. And I've, I've preached from different increments of it and certainly preached from the whole Psalm of 73, uh, I think about a year, year and a half ago when we came in our, in our, in our uh, series on the Psalms. But if you look at it, it says a Psalm of Asaph. He's one of the three dominant choir leaders of Israel's tabernacle. He was, by the way, the unique one because he ministered in the tabernacle and over the tenure of his time, they built the temple. And so he's not only a tent, you'll notice in commentaries, they say, well, he was a, a choir leader of the temple. Well, really, more of his ministry was during the tabernacle and then into the temple, and, and, and he ended his ministry. We don't really know when he died. There's not really much history on that at all. Uh, but it seems like he died in the first half of Solomon's reign. Uh, he was off the, uh, off the scene. You'll see the sons of Asaph, they were his heritage. They, they were, they were the, his, his, uh, what he left, and, and they became a, a big force in the temple worship. And it was his, his children and children, grandchildren and so on and so forth that were big into it, and, and, uh, uh, and he's tremendous. But God used him, as I said when we talked about the Psalms, to write 12 Psalms. He wrote the 50th Psalm. And then he came back and he wrote Psalm 73 through Psalm 83 uh, for a total of 12 psalms. And personally, I like him uh, because it always strikes a chord of reality in me. He's genuine. I never have liked someone who act like that they never struggled with anything. That they were, you know, they got saved and everything was rosy after that. And, and there was never a, uh, a time where uh, sin wasn't uh, something that was overwhelming them. There was always, I always liked the guy that just said, hey, listen, I'm a sinner saved by grace, and I struggle like you struggle, and, and I, I work at walking with God like you have to walk, work walking with God. And that's Asaph. That's his personality. That's what he comes across in, in, the, uh, in the Psalms. And our text has Asaph making an admission, and this is, to me, is really good. He's, I think he follows the tenure of David, but he's making an admission and here, here's his admission. I got my eyes off God. I got my eyes off God. And I put them on the world. In fact, he mentions the wicked. I, I, here I was walking with God, following God. Now, listen, notice who we're talking about here. We're talking about the choir leader of the nation of Israel. It's not just one of us. It, it, here is a uh, guy who has accomplished a great deal and God has used him already to write a psalm here's a guy who who has who has you know you think boy he's got it licked and he makes an admission <laughs> and, and we'll get to it in a while but his admission is I just uh, to put it in our words he got his eyes off the Lord why because he put it on the prosperity of the wicked he looked around at the world around him and saw how well they were doing. And he said, I want to be like them. Why is it that I can't be like them? I can't have what they have. I see a new truck going down the highway. You, got, you know what I'm talking about. A new car going down the highway. And, and it dawns on me, they paid $55,000 for that car. And I'm thinking... How in the world? I'm hoping for a cheap 
used car. Come on. How in the world do they do that? They have boats, vacation homes. Listen, I'm just glad if I have a home. Come on. And, and you, can, you can get your eyes on the world, and you can look at the world, and, and honestly, seriously, you can get your eyes off God and get your eyes on the world, and that's what happened to him. Now, they didn't have boats and cars and all that kind of stuff in his day, but he got his eyes off the Lord. And he admits, it affected me. Look, if you would, at Psalm 73, verse 1. It, out of honor and respect for God's word, would you stand as we uh, read the word of God tonight? It says in verse 1, Truly, God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. By the way, clean heart here means someone living for God. It's a practical statement. So let's read it again. Truly, God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious of the, at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride compasseth them about as a chain. Violence covereth them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. That word loftily, we don't use that a lot in our generation, means they speak with pride. They, they brag about what they've got. Notice what he goes on to say. He, he says, They set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore his people return hither, and waters of a full cup are wrung out of them. And they say, How doth God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? I'd be afraid to say that, by the way. Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Very I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generations of thy children. He's speaking to God with that. He looks at the world around him, and he says, they got it good. But on that level, I don't have it good. I want to talk to you tonight. How do you keep a positive focus when it looks like the world's doing fine and we're struggling to make it through? Let's bow our heads for a word, for our, for a word of prayer. Father, bless, I pray, our time together tonight. And we're just going to praise you for your goodness and thank you that you are good all the time, and all the time you're good. And Lord, I just pray that you'd help me to bring this message in such a way that we look at you through the eyes of the psalmist. We agree, we acknowledge that sometimes if we get our eyes on the world, we become dissatisfied with Christianity. But if we put our eyes on you and recognize you for who you are, we become dissatisfied with the world in which we live. Would you please speak to our hearts? And I'll praise you. I thank you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. Asaph begins at the end. He begins by stating the conclusion of the whole matter. He begins by saying, here's what I came up to. Look, if you would, please, at verse 1. Truly, God is good to Israel, even to such as are, as are of a clean heart. He states that God is good. Now, Israel is his people. Israel represents the saved. It represents the believer. It represents the redeemed. And uh, 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 and he's saying that God is good to the redeemed. 
God is in reality good to all his creation. Listen, if you look around, we are not the only ones that enjoy God's goodness. Listen, the sun came up on the wicked and on the righteous this morning both. The weather is good for both of us. The, listen, God has provided good for all of his creation. And he also makes sure, sure that, that he states that God's goodness isn't just his opinion. Notice if you would, look at your Bible. It says it is a, it is a truth. Truly, God is good. In other words, we might say, of a truth, God is good. In other words, here's an absolute you can depend on, you can take it to the bank, this is the truth, God is good. Say amen. Asaph makes an admission in verse 2, though, that in his heart he had departed from the truth. It says in verse 2, but as for me, God is good, He's good to the redeemed. He's good to the saved. He's good to all mankind. However, but as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. Now, Asaph's feet didn't go into sin. But they came real close. They came real close. Asaph admits, as you and I would have to admit, that our feet are led by our hearts, that we do what's in here. Out of the heart comes, the New Testament says. And what he's saying was, I looked at the wicked, I looked at what was going on, and I said to the men, they've got it good, and we've got it bad, and he almost was gone. Can I put it in a different wording? What he's saying is, I almost quit God. That's what he's saying. I almost said, it isn't worth it. Listen, I've been saved for 45 years now, I think. Somewhere in there. A long time. And you know, there have been times when, you know, someone would say to me, hey, why don't you come out and, and, and go do such and such? Well, I can't. Why? Well, because I have church. Listen, don't you go to church enough? My uncle said to me one time, early, early on, I was in Bible college, one pastor yet, and he said, uh, haven't you taken this a little bit far? But I said, but the Bible commands me to be in the house of God, and God will not bless my life with peace and joy. Uh, the peace and joy I have comes from obeying God. He said, well, you have to obey God every day. He said that. And I'm thinking to myself, well... It'd be a good idea. There have been times when somebody was doing something and I thought, man, I'd like to do that. Oh, but I can't. I went to one NFL game since I've been pastoring. It was the Cincinnati Bengals playing the, uh, the Seattle Seahawks. It was back in the 80s, before Pete Carroll, before all that, that he got there. And they came to Cincinnati. One of my men came and said, Pastor, uh, I have free tickets to the NFL game. And I said, boy, that's good. He says, they play, and in order to get to the first quarter, we'd have to skip church. We'd be in Sunday school. But we'd have to skip church. Now, hold it. I'm the pastor. <laughs> And I'm thinking, you didn't just ask me that, did you? And then he smiled at me and he said, we can miss the first quarter. And so we went to church and we got out of church and I had clothes there and I changed and had my evening sermon with me and we literally sped to Cincinnati, which is Molly knows the area. Dale knows the area. It's about 50 miles. And we went up there and got there. And, and it was back when the, the Bengals were playing in the same stadium as the Cincinnati Reds. That stadium has been since tore down. And the Reds have their own stadium. And the Bengals have their own stadium. But we were there. And by the way, they went to the Super Bowl that year, the Bengals. So they were doing, yeah, it's, it's, 
It's amazing, not like it is today. But anyway, you know, and we got there and we watched it. And you know what was going on? The game was starting to go a little bit long. He said, Pastor, we're going to have to get back. And I'm saying, well, just, just, just one more play, you know. And finally, that was it. We had to leave. I walked in at two minutes to six. And I felt so guilty because I really wanted to stay for that game. And the thought came to my mind, what's the big deal? I go to church like every day. What if I'm just 10 minutes late? And I wasn't, but the very thought made me feel bad. That's what Asaph is facing. Asaph is facing wanting to take and have the joy of the world, and why not? But his walk with God requires something different. It requires sacrifice. He says, I was well nigh. Do you understand the words well nigh? The words well nigh, listen to me. The words well nigh mean this. I was on the edge. I was on the edge. Because they have it all well. And he says, he goes through a long litany, if you would, of things of what he did. And then he said, but something happened. Look, if you would, at verse 17. This is where I was. This is what's going on. Maybe somebody in your, in your uh, some Christian's been mean to you. Why should I put up with this? Maybe something's happened where you feel like that, that you're not uh, received as well as others. Why should I put up with this? That's where he's at. He's on the edge. Well nigh. Get to verse 17 look there he, he well, look at verse 16 I thought to know this it was too painful for me it really plagued me what was going on then it says until I went into the sanctuary of God then understood I their end surely thou didst set them in slippery places thou castest them down in destruction how are they brought up into destruction into desolation as in a moment they are utterly consumed with terrors now listen to me I'm saying Asaph went to the house of God he heard the truth of God and the hearing of the truth of God changed his perspective changed his outlook he, he and, and he conviction got all over him you ever done something, said something, thought something, and just that thought or saying something in a, in a moment of anger, you didn't really mean it, but you said it, you felt guilty? Look, if you would, at verse 21. Now, I'm setting the, the, the stage for what I really want to say tonight. Look at verse 21. Thus my heart was grieved, and I was pricked in my reins. So foolish was I, and ignorant. I was as a beast before thee. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by my right hand. Now, what did he say? He said, once I realized the truth that God is good, and that I'm envying the world over the blessings of God, I really, really felt bad. I, 
I don't know about you, but work with me here. You ever chew yourself out? Come on. Say, you, now you're not saying it out loud, and you're not saying it to anybody else, and I get that. But you say to yourself, well, that was stupid. You ever say to yourself, to self, well, that was boneheaded. What was I thinking? That's what happened to him. He said, I wouldn't talk to myself this way. You might be better if you did. Right. <laughs> I'm not saying let someone else talk to you that way. I wouldn't like it either. But I, be I beat myself up. I've said something at church, been different around with somebody, and, and they got to, you know, bantering with me, and I got to bantering with them, and, and I walked away a little bit later, and I thought what I said man how did they take it and here I'm supposed to be a pastor and I get to feeling like and I mean I do I've lost sleep over it at times I probably offended that person wrongfully offended that person there have been times I've actually got on the phone and said sister so and so this is usually ladies are the ones that always aggravate me Molly but anyway uh, not picking on anybody at all. And I've actually got on the phone and said, I'm sorry. And they always say, for what? It's the ones I don't call and say, I'm sorry. They're thinking about it too. Oh, come on. Okay, let's be honest. How many of us at, were at church or with the Christians, other Christians, and you know they didn't mean it in your mind but they said something, and it hurt. Come on. Sure, absolutely. Now, and, and you've had this argument. Here's, here's the conversation you have with yourself. <sighs> they didn't mean that. I'm just being a baby about it. I'm being too sensitive. But your feelings still hurt. Come on. And you think about it. You dwell on it. It's sort of like having an argument with somebody and you leave, whether at work or with your spouse or something, and you leave and you're driving somewhere and the whole time you're having that argument over again. Only this time you're telling them everything you want to tell them that you didn't tell them, that you wished you had told them. <laughs> oh, come on. He was grieved. He hurt because of being a bonehead. He was grieved by it. And he looked at you. How could I have done that? I know all this truth. And God's been so good to me. How could I think that way? Before we move on, let me say this. But we do. And this becomes this which becomes this, which becomes this. That's why the Bible says, if you have odd against your brother, go to him between you and him alone. Because it never stays here. Never. It always does this. That's why it says, it, leave your gift at the altar, leave your service to God there, and go make thy friend sure. Why? Because it always grows. Here he was. He was looking at the wicked. He was looking at men who, were, who dared to say, does God really hear your prayers? Is God really real? I'd be afraid to say that. And yet, God doesn't strike them dead. God's merciful. But here I am, and I felt so foolish. Look at the rest of Look back at verse, what is it, 21, I thought? Look back at verse 21. Notice what he says. He says, thus my heart was greed and I was pricked in my reign. So foolish was I and ignorant. Man, that's bad. Yeah, anybody here ever call themselves ignorant? <laughs> that's pretty bad. Someone, listen, someone said to you, you just don't understand, you're ignorant. Those fighting words. But he's having this conversation with himself. 
And he goes on to say, I was as a beast before thee, O God. Now, help me un- let me help you understand something. What I want you to get is he was negative because he looked this way and stopped looking that way. But once he looked that way, when he took his eyes down and looked this way, he saw differently. In other words, he was negative and became positive with things of God. Let me make my transition. Here's what I'm trying to say. It is so easy for you and me to become negative in our outlook toward life. We are. Just like Asaph, we tend to view many things from the negative instead of the positive. By the way, shame on us. But we do. We don't have to look very far to find someone that's a whole lot worse off than we ever thought of being. But we don't look at that. We look at somebody we perceive better off than us and wonder why, why not me? Asaph was faced with the reality of the goodness of God when he came to God's house. Herein is this. That's how you remain positive. You remain positive instead of negative by some very easy things. Write these down. Number one. Read God's Word regularly. Now hold it. Not so you can get through in a year. Not so you can say, I read the whole Word of God. Those are both good things. But so that you can have such a relationship with God that you stay positive. Psalm 119, verse 50. Turn there if you would. Psalm 119, verse 50. Now listen to me. I'm not trying to be preachy tonight. I'm on purpose trying, look up, trying to be just practical. What can help you in your Christian walk not to be negative. While you turn to Psalm 119, have you heard any good news today from the media? Is there anything that they tell you, you say, whoo, it's good to be alive. The economy is going down. Our politicians need to change everything. We've all been taught the wrong things. It's not, it's not right to have your own stuff. Everybody ought to have everything in common. We ought to take care of the poor. And by the way, the poor are somebody that's just a little less than you. And you ought to take and take care of them. And you ought to let me run your life. And, and listen, by the way, because you don't accept uh, the moral code of our day and you stand up and say, no, 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 there are certain things that are morally right and certain things that are morally wrong, you're a wicked person. And if you didn't get your shot, you're a wicked person. You heard anything good from the news today? No. You know, the truth is you won't. You know, the truth of the matter is we have so much that's coming at us all the time. We need to have something positive. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't grow up in the era of the Internet. I didn't even have a cell phone until I was almost 50. I didn't have all that influence. Our young people, the young adults in here, you have it harder than my generation had it. You do. Because you got all this, all that's coming at you, this media that is so pervasive and so in your face coming at you. You must have something positive in your life or you're going to be a negative person. Did you ever notice that all the commentators on television are angry? doesn't matter which side they're on. They can be the most liberal of liberal. He's angry. Can't understand all those people on the right. And the, people on the, le- uh, the people on the right, they're so angry. Can't understand those knuckleheads on the left. They're all angry. You know why? Because they dwell on it. Can I suggest to you that you ought to read God's word regularly? Look at Psalm 119, verse 49. Remember the word of thy servant upon which thou hast caused me to hope. This is my comfort in my affliction, for thy word hath quickened me. The psalmist said, this is my comfort. This is where I get the positive influx. This is where I get the positive feed. 
Listen, the Bible gives us assurance. Can I tell you one of the things you need to know? Listen to me. Here it is. God loves you. God cares about you. Now, all of us, whether you admit it or not, we're all knuckleheads. We all do things at time and think, what was I thinking? But God loves you in spite of it. God loves you in spite of all your frailties. You may have royally messed up, and you have, but God still loves you. You need to know that God cares. You know where you get that from? Here. From here. Notice what he said in verse 50. In verse 50, this is my comfort in my affliction, for thy word hath quickened me. Reading the Bible is about more than just putting knowledge of God into our minds. It's about getting to know God. One of the things, and I've said this to you, and, and, and you know this from watching my life, me and Sherry really like being together. We like spending time together. I like doing men things and doing that kind of stuff, but I really like spending time with my wife. You know why? Because we have a relationship. We drive, and the last, the vacation, first vacation in several years was last year when I took off for three weeks. Pastor was here. I didn't have to worry about it. <clears throat> I didn't, I didn't concern about it. He had, he had the reins. He did a wonderful job. Say amen. Did a wonderful job. And I left for three plus weeks. And I drove almost 5,000 miles. And most of the time in the car, we had no radio on. We had no speakers on. Why? Not on purpose. But we get talking about something. We have the radio on or the, her, the music on, and we get talking about something. And I can't hear two things at one time anymore. I either have to listen to one or the other. I can't hear both. So I'd reach up and turn it off. And we talked, and we talked, and we talked. And then we'd say, we're there. We just drove 250 miles. You know what it was? A relationship. A relationship. This time we went on vacation. We took all, so we'd have music and all that kind of stuff. And we listened to a little bit of it, but most of the time, we were just talking. Why? Because I like talking to her. I have a relationship with her. And she loves me and I love her. That's what God wants to have with you. That's what God wants to have with you. The Bible gives us assurance that God is with us wherever he goes. What a wonderful assurance. God loves us. He died for us. He provides for us. He wants to commune with us. And you know what we do so often? We forget God. We get so busy in our life. And I'm not talking about spending hours. I'm not talking about uh, spending hours and hours. I'm talking about just getting to know God through his word. I'm not talking about reading the whole Bible in a year. I'm talking about reading and saying, I'm reading to get to know my creator. What a blessing. What a blessing. Do you know why this world doesn't have peace? They don't know God. They don't know God. How is it all the martyrs that we've learned about over the years died singing a hymn, died praising God? They had peace. Listen, you can keep your mansions and all your treasures. There's nothing like the peace of God. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusts in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Why do, I, why do I bring such a simple, really not a very difficult principle? Because it works. This is what we need. We just need to spend some time reading the Word, being consistent all the time, thinking about what we're reading, Listen, if you read one story and you look at the woman that had the issue of blood 
12 years, and you just read that passage and read that story and say, man, how great God was all the rest of the day, it can be a blessing to you. The Word of God brings peace and joy that passeth all understanding. Let me give you another simple truth. Simple truth. Not only read God's Word regularly, but can I just tell you, rely on His promises. Rely on His promises. God's promises are real. God keeps His Word. Someone asked me one time, how do you know you're saved? I said, because God said so. Well, how can you know? Because God put it in here, and I know that I know that I know. His promises are real. What you believe determines your outlook and your actions. Robert Morrison was a missionary, one of the first missionaries to China, by the way. And he sailed into China, I think in like 1805 or something like that. He sailed into China, and the, you know, that the main way of was sails going on a ship. And he's reading the Bible, and the storm, the, the, the ship comes into a storm, a great storm, overwhelming storm. And everybody starts moving around and running around and trying to get the sails down and trying to do all the things to make sure they're safe. And, and they're running around and, and they're screaming and, and, and it turns to total chaos. And just so happened, Robert Morrison was at this passage. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. Isaiah 43. And God in that moment said to him, Robert, I have a purpose for you in, in China. You're going to be fine. And Robert got up from reading the Bible. The ship's going everywhere. And he started going around and saying, God told me it's going to be okay. God told me it's going to be okay. And they started saying, well, how do you know that? It isn't because the weather has indicated it. It isn't because the seas have indicated it. But God told me. Sure enough, in about 40 minutes, the, the seas calmed down. The winds quieted down. He didn't pray that that would happen. God told him in his heart after reading the Word of God. It became one of his most favorite verses. He went on to go to China, and he translated the entire Bible in the dialect of the people he was serving for over 25 years, and he made a big difference in his generation. I'm saying that God can be trusted. God can be trusted. Paul did the same in Acts 27. You remember, you just preached on it not so long ago. David, David later wrote, many of the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of all of them. God keeps his promises. Now, not everything will turn out roses. Let's face it, we do face heartaches and trials, but God will walk with you through those trials. And you're not going to get out of those trials. I told you about the fellow that I visited in the hospital. He was in, I was pastor in Ohio, and his daughter said, could you go visit my dad? My dad doesn't want to, to acknowledge God, and he's just denying God. And he's in the hospital, and we don't know why he's in the hospital. So I went up to the hospital in Wilmington, Ohio, and he was in this one room, 242. Remember the room? 241, I'm sorry. And he's in this room, and I walked in. He's sitting Indian style on the top of the bed. Bed's mate, sitting Indian style on top of the bed. I introduced myself. He talked to me, and I said, what are you doing? Waiting to go to University Hospital. University Hospital was in Cincinnati. So they're transferring me there. I said, why? I don't know. 
He said, they seem to think I'm sick, but I don't think so. They've done some tests. Well, they're going to do some more tests when they get up there, but they're, they're insisting I'm very ill. I said, okay, but you don't feel ill? Well, I don't feel my best. I said, okay, well, I'll come up to Cincinnati and visit you. It's 50 miles away. I'll come up and visit you in a couple of days. That night at dinner, the phone rings while I'm having dinner with the family. I get up and I answer the phone. It's his daughter. He died. Come to find out what they told him was he had cancer. But he thought as long as I don't acknowledge it, it won't happen. Listen, we're going to go through some hard times. We will. What you need is not victory in every one of them. What you need is God in every one of them. Trust God. Trust God. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I will always be there with you. So says our Lord. Then I want to give you, you know, ask, I got, let me back up because I was about to go away from that. Ask God to show you his promises. Ask God to show you his promises in the word of God. See, the, the, the difference is when Paul was speaking to God and Robert Morrison was speaking to God and God was taking and, and talking to them, God spoke to them because they asked God to speak to them. Ask God to speak to you. Ask God to speak to you. Realize this. All things work together for good. I know we don't like that verse sometimes when we're facing difficulty because we're going through a difficult time and someone says, well, you know, all things work together for good. Well, it don't feel very good right now. Oh, come on, you've been there. But God promised us that he would take every event of our life and use it, if we'd let him, to mold for good. It says, and we know all things work together for good to them that love God and who are called according to his purpose. Listen, and, and, and I'm going to close up pretty quick, but if God has a plan for your life, I was 20 years old when I got saved. I'm now 66, getting ready to be 67 in a few months. And I didn't know that. And I got saved. And I had my life planned. I was going to spend the, the next few years in the military, make money. Money's an important thing. And then I was going to get a different career. And over time, as I began to walk with God, God made it clear he didn't want me to finish my military career. Six and a half years active duty. All I had was 13 and a half years left. And I'd have a retirement somewhere around $5,000 a month I, I estimate because I would have been a chief by then, a chief master, because I had a plan. But God began to say, no, I have a different plan. And I'm glad I followed God's plan. I'm glad to stand here tonight and tell you after almost 40 years of pastoring that I was wise to listen to God. But I didn't see it. I had to trust him. God will make your life turn out for good, even the negatives. Let me give you another thought. And Sherry has always had some health issues. In 1985, I, 1984, I become a pastor. In 1984, Miss Sherry is having some very, very, very big health issues and we can't figure it out. Here's my prayer to God. God, what more can I do? I'm trying everything I can to serve you, and Sherry is going through all this. You say, you'd never say that. Yeah, you would. And I did. And I was praying, Lord, please help me, Sherry. She, we had been married for several years by that time, and... She couldn't have kids. We didn't know why. We were doing everything we could. If that had in vitro fertilization, we'd have tried that. I don't think they had it back then, or I was too poor to get it. I'm not sure. Then they diagnosed her with lupus. The doctor, Dr. Leonard, right, 
sat me down, and he said, I got to talk to you. He said, number one, I don't think your wife can ever conceive. But if she does, I want you to know that where she's at with her lupus right now, she will die. If she conceives within three months, she will die. And absolutely the baby will die. I want you to understand that she should never have children. And I wondered, Lord, why? Why? And the Lord said to me, I remember the highway, Highway 297, Tolono, Illinois. He said to me, if I take Sherry tonight, she was in the hospital, by the way, in critical condition. If I take Sherry tonight, will you serve me tomorrow? You say, he didn't really talk to you. No, he talked to me. And on that highway, I said, Lord, if Sherry's gone tonight, I'll serve you tomorrow. And he said, she'll be all right. And I cannot tell you the peace that came over me when that happened. We still prayed about children. We ended up going 14 years with no kids. Can you imagine, can you even imagine Sherry living with me for 14 years and not getting kids? I mean, it's like being cheated royally. We didn't have kids. We ended up going into foster care. There's a whole story behind that. Now listen to me, here's what I want you, I want, I want you to understand something. And when Amanda walked in that room, our very first foster child became our daughter. When she walked into our house, it wasn't long in the process of her being in our house that I absolutely understood why God had made us wait so long. All that time, he had been molding our heart. He had been shaping us. Because when she walked in, she, not, she wasn't a foster kid. She was ours, as if we gave birth to her. And it's been that way now for 33 years. And she is my little girl. And will be my little girl to the day I'm in heaven. But what, would I have done that if we'd gotten married and had two or three kids of our own all of a sudden? Maybe not. You say, well, maybe I would have. Well, you might have. But I don't know that we would have. And I look back, and here's what I've realized. Because she's been ill, because of not being able to have kids, it caused her and I to be closer. And I have such a precious gift because of the negative. All things work for good to them that love God and are called to his called according to his purpose. What I want you to understand is this. A positive attitude doesn't come from positive thinking. It comes from positive influence. The positive influence you need is God's word, God's promises, and recognize God is working in your life. And no matter how negative or what is going on in your life, God is doing it because he loves you. He knows what's best. I look at the world going on around us and I say to myself, I don't care. Why? Because God is good. Truly, God is good to the redeemed. Especially, especially to those that walk with him. Verse 1. How to be positive in a negative time. Keep your eyes on God. And by the way, not all things will work out. But God will use that too. God's good, amen?